Good evening, everybody. So we will continue our study of the compendium of philosophy or the comprehensive manual of the Abhidhamma. This is the third session of our Abhidhamma class and we started last year about this time. Now after you have gone through the six chapters, you have already studied the four ultimate truths or the four ultimate realities, namely consciousness, mental factors, material properties and Nibbana. During this class we will study the remaining three chapters of this book, the seventh, the eighth and the ninth chapters. So the seventh chapter deals with what are called categories. Actually this chapter gave us the different names given to different mental states and material properties that are included in the four ultimate realities. And it is important and necessary that we are familiar with some names or some designations given to these um, mental states and material properties because if we do not understand this it is difficult for us to understand the teachings of the Buddha in the Sutta Bhitaka. For example in the Dhammapada we find the word Asava mentioned in two places. And if we do not know what asavas are, or how many of them are there, we will not understand the teaching completely. Only when we understand through the study of Abhidhamma can we understand the teachings in the Sutta Bhitaka uh, fully and correctly. So this chapter gives such names, such different names given to the uh, mental and material states. Now the chapter begins with a verse saying these 72 kinds of entities have already been described with their characteristics and so on. Up to this point we have studied the four ultimate realities and the first one is consciousness. Although there are 89 or 121 types of consciousness As to the characteristic, consciousness is taken to be one. Consciousness has the characteristic of being aware of the object. So being aware of the object is the characteristic of consciousness and so consciousness is said to be one although it is divided into 89 or 121 types. And next there are 52 Chetasikas or mental factors. Each of these 52 Chetasikas has its own characteristic and so we take them as 52. So we take consciousness as one and mental factors or Chetasikas as 52. And then there are material properties and if you remember in the sixth chapter the material properties are taught and there are 28 
material properties. But among the 28 material properties, only 18 are taken here because they are the ones concretely produced material phenomena. That means they are the real ones, the real material properties, and the other 10 are actually some modes of these material properties. And these 10 material properties are not the object of vipassana meditation. So these 10 are not reckoned separately as individual entities here. So we take 18 of them, the first 18 of the 28 material properties taught in the sixth chapter. And then the last one is Nibbana. Nibbana is taken to be one. And so when we add them up, we get 72 kinds of entities or 72 kinds of states that have uh, their own individual essence. These states, both uh, mental and material, will be dealt with in this chapter. So there are categories and this uh, chapter is divided into four sections the section on unwholesome states, the section on mixed categories, then the section on requisites of enlightenment, and the section on the whole, that is, on all. The first section, the section of unwholesome states, begin with what are called taints. Now you may see the word taint on page 265 of the manual. When studying Abhidhamma or studying in the Buddha's teachings, we cannot avoid using the original Pali words. So we will always go with the Pali words because translations can be misleading. Sometimes one and the same word is translated differently in English and so we are not able to ascertain uh, which is uh, meant. Now the word asawa, the first word asawa here, is translated as defilements in one place and then corruptions in another place. And then here it is translated as taints. And Yanamoli translates is as kankas. So how are we to un understand asawas? So it is better to keep the word asawa when we talk about or when we study this and try to understand the meaning of the word asawa. Asawa is originally the name of the intoxicating drinks because when people make these intoxicating drinks, they have to ferment them. So one meaning of the word asawa is long fermented drink or intoxicating drink. And anything uh, that is long fermented, which can be called asawa, is none other than the unwholesome mental states mentioned here because they have been with us for how many lives? Not years. They have been with us for long, long time from time immemorial and so 
when we say something is called asava because uh, it is long fermented, then we should call these mental states asavas. So these mental states are called asava because they are long fermented or they are intoxicating. So whenever uh, we have these mental states in our mind, our minds become intoxicated. And also asava is defined as something that flows out of some other thing, that oozes out of some other thing. Now there's an abscess, for example, and then pus and blood ooze out of that abscess. So something that flow out is also called asava. Now when we see something and we like it, and there is attachment, there is uh, greed for that object, and that means attachment or greed is flowing out of our eyes. So when we hear something and we like it, then the attachment is uh, oozing or flowing out of our ears and so on. And so they are called asavas in Pali. And the commentaries also explain it as something that flow right up to the topmost plane of existence by way of plane of existence and that flow right up to what is called the change of lineage by way of the Dhamma. That means these mental states can arise even in the highest of the 31 planes of existence. The highest of the 31 planes of existence is the highest, the fourth of the four immaterial realms. So even in that immaterial realm, these asavas or attachment, wrong view and ignorance can arise. So uh, they are said to flow up to the topmost plane of existence. And as to the mental states, they can take as object almost everything, except those that are called supramundane. So the change of lineage mentioned here is the last moment before the moment of enlightenment. So when one gains enlightenment, one changes into another type of person. One, one's lineage is said to be changed from an ordinary worldling into a noble person. So these asavas can flow up to that point up to that point of change of lineage. That means these can take as object the last moment uh, before the moment of enlightenment and so they are called asava in Pali. And there are said to be four of them. The first one is in Pali called Kama Sava. And the second one, Bhava Sava, and the third one, Ditta Sava, and the fourth one, Avijja Sava. Kama Sava means sensual desire, attachment to anything, desire for anything, desire for sense objects. And the second one, Bhava Sava, is 
attachment to existence that means attachment to existence in the in the material realm and in material realms i hope you you remember the 31 planes of existence there are planes of existence called rupa vachara and arupa vachara so rupa vachara and arupa vachara are the planes that are higher than the kama vachara plane or sensuous plane and attachment to those planes the rupa vachara plane and arupa vachara plane are called the bhavasava the attained of attachment to existence and also attachment to jhanas is called bhavasava when a person gets jhana and say he dies with that jhana intact he is reborn as a brahma so the jhanas can produce rebirth as brahmas the attachment to those jhanas is called bhava sava later on the other himself will explain what kama and bhava here represent and the third is wrong view the taint of wrong views taking things to be permanent or taking things to be without cause and so on and also the wrong view regarding one's own self so they are called wrong view the wrong view you already uh, studied in the first chapter and the last one is the taint of ignorance not understanding correctly so these four are called asavas asavas of sensual desire asava of existence asava of wrong view and asava of ignorance so these four are called asavas intoxicants or flowing out or those that can flow up to the topmost existence and that can flow up to the topmost mental state of change of lineage on next is four floods ogas in pali they are called ogas four kinds of floods actually these four kinds of floods are the same as the four kinds of asavas so they are given different name here so one and the same mental state is called asava in one place and oga or flood in another place so this is the elegance of buddha's teachings now when buddha taught he taught so that his listeners are able to understand and able to gain enlightenment and different people have different dispositions different likes and dislikes and so according to the likes and dislikes of his listeners Buddha used different terms or different names to suit their different inner dispositions so at one point uh, Buddha may use the word asava to, to describe the, these four mental states but at another place he may use the word oga and so on so oga are called floods they are the same so flood of sensual desire flood of attachment to existence the flood of wrong views and the flood of ignorance now they are called floods 
because they sweep beings away into the ocean of existence. Now when you are caught in the flood, you are carried away by the flood and it is very difficult to, to get out of it. So in the same way, when these arise in our minds, it is very difficult to get rid of them. We have been practicing say, meditation for many years and we still have these mental defilements, we still have these uh, floods in our minds, attachment, and wrong view sometimes, and ignorance. When they overwhelm us, we are carried away by them, and it is difficult to get away from them. It is difficult to cross them. So when there is a flood, you know, it is very difficult to, to cross the flood. So, because they sweep beings away into the ocean of samsara or existence and they are hard to cross, they are hard to get rid of, these mental states are, are called floods. And the next category is called bonds. There are also four bonds the same mental states as the asavas. So the bond of sensual desire, the bond of attachment to existence, the bond of wrong view and the bond of ignorance. Now they are called bonds or in Pali they are called yoga because they yoke beings to suffering. They set beings to suffering and they do not allow them to escape. Now once these mental states arise in our minds. We are, as it were, yoked to suffering. We are bound to suffer because since they are unwholesome mental states, they are bound to bring unpleasant results. And it is very difficult to escape from them and so they are called bonds. So in Pali, they are called yoga. Now the word yoga is now very, very popular. And the word yoga has different meanings. So it can mean making effort or practice. So practice of meditation is also called yoga. But here the word yoga does not mean meditation. It means the mental states here, uh, sensual desire, attachment to existence, wrong view, and ignorance. They are called yoga here. You may have met the word yoga kema. If, if you are familiar with Pali, you, you may be familiar with that word yoga kema. And there yoga means these four bonds and not, not practice of meditation. And then the next category is called Ganta knots, K-N-O-T-S. They are called knots because they tie the mind to the body or the present body to bodies in the future existences. Now, the name of these knots are Abhijja Kaya Ganta. Oh, please, please look at the Pali passage there. Abhijja Kaya Ganta. Now there is the word Kaya. The word Kaya here means both the physical body and also the mental body, um, a group of mental states. So the word kaya often means not just the, the, the body we, we understand, but it means a group, a collection. So here it is in that sense that it is used here, the physical body and mental body or a group of physical material properties and a group of uh, mental states. So these four knots 
tie the mind to the body or the present body to the future existences. That is why they are called knots. And the first one of them is the bodily knot of covetousness. That means attachment. Attachment is one knot. Now it is very, very obvious that when there is attachment, we are tied to something and so uh, we are in the knot. And the second one is the bodily knot of ill will, anger. So the second one is anger. So anger is also called in Pali, Kaya Ganta, the bodily knot. And the third one is the bodily knot of adherence to rites and ceremonies. Now, here it is important to understand this word correctly. The Pali word is Silabhata Paramasa. Wrongly taking Sila and Vata as a means to purification. In the commentaries, Sila, Sila is explained as the habit, the habit of cows, habit of dogs, habit of animals and so on. And Vata is like, like habit, it is behavior, behaving like uh, like dogs, cows, and so on, and taking uh, those as the uh, as the means to purification is called adherence to rites and ceremonies. So, according to the definition given in the uh, text themselves, as well as in the commentaries, it is a wrong view about the the habits and the behavior which one takes to be a right path to enlightenment. So taking something that does not lead to Nibbana directly as one leading to Nibbana is this wrong view. So according to the definitions given in the commentaries, taking the, the practice of uh, dogs and cows as the right way uh, leading to enlightenment is, is this bodily knot. But Mahasi Syaru said, taking just dana to be the way to enlightenment. Taking just sila to be the way to enlightenment is also this kind of wrong view. Not that dana is bad, not that sila is bad. We must practice dana, we must practice sila, right? But we must not remain content with just practice of dana and sila. Dana and sila can create conditions for the practice of meditation which will directly lead us to enlightenment. So only the practice of the Eightfold Path is the real path. So taking the practices other than the Eightfold Path as a way to enlightenment is also this kind of bodily knot, the adherence to rites and ceremonies. If we take chanting to be enough for our enlightenment, we may have this kind of bodily knot. Chanting is good, uh, it, it suits our mind and it can lead our mind to the Buddha, but still it is not enough. So taking any practice other than the Eightfold Path 
the practice of faithful path as the way to enlightenment uh, is this kind of uh, uh, bodily knot, bodily knot of adherence to rites and ceremonies. And then the last one is bodily knot of dogmatic belief that this alone is the truth. This alone is true and any other is false. So taking that way is also a kind of bodily knot. Sometimes we think that what we believe in is, uh, is true and any other uh, belief is false. So if we take that way, we may not be free from this kind of bodily knot. So these are four bodily knots. Bodily knots of covetousness and then of ill will and then of adherence to rites and ceremonies and uh, of dogmatic belief that this alone is true. Later on we will identify uh, the ultimate realities with this. So the next category is called clinging. In Pali they are called upadhana. When we talk about craving and clinging, then there is a difference between craving and clinging. Not so strong attachment is called craving and very strong attachment is called uh, upadana or clinging. But the commentaries point out that this kind of clinging can also be understood more broadly as craving for any of the things of the world. So, uh, commentaries say that any kind of attachment, any kind of uh, craving can be called upadana or clinging. But when we talk about uh, the craving and clinging, uh, as for example in the dependent origination then we have to differentiate between craving and clinging. So in that case craving is a not so strong attachment and clinging is very strong attachment. So when it reaches the level of clinging then it cannot let go. And there are four kinds of clinging and the first one is Kama Upadana. So clinging to sensual pleasures, attachment to sensual things. And second is clinging to wrong views. Actually wrong views themselves are called clinging. And the third is clinging to rites and ceremonies, the same, the same as the bodily knot. And the fourth is clinging to a doctrine of self. So to believe in, in the existence of self and clinging to a doctrine of self is adoption of personality view. That means uh, in, in Pali it is called Sakkaya Deity. Sakkaya Deity means the existing body and wrong view about existing body. That means uh, uh, there is a self or the, the body is a permanent and so on. So that kind of mm, view is called Sakkaya Diti. And clinging to that kind of view is clinging to doctrine of self. And there are 20 types of personality view mentioned in the sutras as well as in Abhidhamma. And they are considering each of the five aggregates in four ways. Now there are five aggregates. Now, when one regards um, 
the, the materiality as self. That is one kind of uh, personality view. And also taking self as possessing materiality, that is another kind of personality view. Or believing that materiality is in self. That is one kind. And self in materiality is another kind of uh, personality view. So the personality view can be of four kinds. Taking materiality as self or taking self as possessing materiality or taking materiality as in self or taking self as in materiality. So the same with the other four aggregates and so altogether there are twenty kinds. We will find these clingings again in the doctrine of dependent origination. And the next category is, is hindrances or nivaranas. They are called nivaranas because they obstruct the way to a heavenly rebirth and to the attainment of nibbana. Now these uh, nivaranas are obstacles to the way to a heavenly rebirth, obstacles to attainment of jhanas, and obstacles to attainment of nibbana. So they are called nivaranas in Pali. The nivaranas is translated as hindrance. So these nivaranas or hindrances are mental factors that prevent an arisen wholesome state from arising and which do not allow arisen wholesome states to endure. And it is said that the first five hindrances are the major obstacles to the attainment of jhanas. And the sixth hindrance is the major obstacle to the arising of wisdom. Now, six hindrances are one, sensual desire, two, ill will, three, sloth and torpor, four, restlessness and remorse, five, doubt, and six, ignorance. So these are called hindrances because they obstruct the way to heavenly rebirth and so on. Now, here, number one is sensual desire, so it is attachment to sensual things and it is not difficult to understand. The second one is ill will, anger, hate, and so on. But the third and fourth, sloth and torpor, and restlessness and worry. Actually, sloth is one mental factor, and torpor is another mental factor. So two mental factors uh, compounded as one here and called one hindrance. And the same with number four, restlessness and remorse. Restlessness is one thing and remorse is another. Restlessness is one chaitasika and remorse is another chaitasika. And these two are taken as one hindrance here. So why? Please go to page 268. Third line, uh, the Bidama commentaries explain that sloth and torpor and restlessness and remorse are joined into compounds because of the similarity in their respective functions, conditions, and antidotes or opposites. So <clears throat> they have similar functions, similar conditions, and similar opposites. That is why these two are joined together as one. Now sloth and torpor both have the function of engendering mental sluggishness. So they have the same function of mental sluggishness and they are conditioned by laziness 
and drowsiness. And they are countered by arousing energy. So that is why they are taken as one hindrance here. They are described as one hindrance. But according to the ultimate reality, they are uh, two, not one. And restlessness and remorse share the function of engendering disquietude. So restlessness causes disquietude and worry, I mean uh, remorse as the function of uh, causing disquietude. And they are conditioned by disturbing thoughts. Both are conditioned by disturbing thoughts and they are countered by the development of calm. That means countered by the development of uh, samatha. Since they are similar in functions, conditions and opposites, they are compounded together as one mental hindrance. And number five is doubt, and doubt is doubt about the Buddha, the Dhamma, the Sangha, doubt about uh, the, the practice and so on. And number six is ignorance. It is delusion or not understanding or even understanding wrongly. Now then the next category is latent dispositions. The Pali word for latent dispositions is anusaya. lying dormant, something like that. So there are seven of them, the latent dispositions to sensual lust, uh, number two, attachment to existence, again, number three, aversion, number four, conceit, number five, wrong views, number six, doubt, and number seven, ignorance. Now they are called latent dispositions. Actually they are defilements but they lie dormant in our uh, mental continuity uh, looking for a chance to come up to the surface so they are like uh, lying under the surface uh, waiting for a chance to come up now we are studying Abhidhamma now I hope uh, we have no attachment or uh, no ill will now in our minds. But they lie dormant in our con uh, mental continuity. So if there is a condition uh, for anger to arise, then anger will arise. So the anger uh, that lie dormant in our mental continuity is called an anusaya or latent disposition. So when they come up to the surface, they may be called kilesas or defilements, the last category. There are said to be seven of them, and they are sensual lust, that means attachment to the sense objects, and then attachment to existence, the same as the second asawa, and then aversion, that means ill will, and number four, conceit, pride, and number five, wrong views, and number six, doubt, and number seven, ignorance. It is this anusaya that path consciousness eradicates. And only path consciousness can eradicate the, the anusayas or latent dispositions. Now we practice vipassana meditation. So when we are practicing vipassana meditation and we are making notes of the objects we observe, we are preventing the mental defilements from arising. But that advantment of mental defilement is just momentary. When there are conditions, then they will come up again. So the abandonment of mental defilements by the practice of vipassana is 
momentary abandonment. But the abandonment of mental defilements by path consciousness or at the moment of enlightenment is total. That means the abandonment of the anusayas, abandonment of the latent dispositions. So once they are abandoned, once they are eradicated by path consciousness, they will not arise again in the mental continuity of that person. So that is the difference. So what the enlightenment or what the path consciousness abandons is this latent tendency, not the mental defilements that have arisen, not the mental defilements uh, that were in the past, not the mental defilements that are to be in the future, not the mental defilements that are present, but the latent tendencies of these mental defilements are what uh, abandoned by path consciousness. So this is the most difficult abandonment, the abandonment of the uh, latent dispositions. And the next category is fetters. And there are ten of them according to Sutanda method and also ten according to Abhidhamma method. So they are number one, the fetters of sensual lust. Number two, attachment to fine material existence. That, that means Rupa Vajra. Number three, attachment to immaterial existence, Arupa Vajra. Aversion, that is uh, anger or dosa. Conceit, wrong views, adherence to rites and ceremonies, doubt, restlessness, and ignorance. Now they are called fetters because they bind beings to the round of existence. They are like ropes that bind us to the existence or to the uh, round of samsara. The next group is called fetters according to Abhidhamma method. And there's a little, a little difference. Number one is sensual lust, the same. Number two, attachment to existence. Number three, aversion. Number four, conceit. Number five, wrong views. Number six, adherence to rites and ceremonies. Number seven, doubt. Number eight, envy. Envy is not included in Sotanta method. And number nine, average is also not included in Sotanta method. And number ten, ignorance. So there is a little difference between these two lists. And Lady Shero said that the first of the ten fetters is mentioned both in Sota Pitaka and Abhidhamma Pitaka. But the second set is only uh, mentioned only in the Abhidhamma Pitaka. And the next is defilements. We are very familiar with defilements. We have been talking about defilements uh, many times. But we must understand how many defilements are there. So there are ten defilements. The first is greed, the loba, attachment. Number two, uh, the second one is hatred. And third, delusion. That means ignorance. And fourth, conceit. And fifth, wrong views, sixth, doubt, seventh, sloth, eighth, restlessness, nine, shamelessness, that means moral shamelessness. We met moral shamelessness among the 52 Chaitasikas. And tenth, fearlessness of wrongdoing. So shamelessness of wrongdoing and fearlessness of wrongdoing. These ten are called defilements in, in English, but in Pali they are called kilesas. Now there are two meanings to the word kilesa. One is afflicting, 
so they afflict or they torment the mind when there are th these mental defilements in our minds our minds are said to be afflicted or said to be tormented so they are called in Pali kilesas now the other meaning is they defile beings by dragging them down to a mentally soiled and depraved condition so since they defile our minds they are called kilesas or defilement so there are two meanings to the Pali word kilesa one that afflicts and the other uh, one that defiles so the English, English translation defilements is just uh, one meaning that is why it is important that we always keep the Pali word along with the English translation because here as in the case of the word asawa there is no one English word to cover the meaning conveyed by the word asawa or here kilesa so we have now altogether how many categories asawa oga, uh, flood, yoga, born and then kanta, not and ubarana, clinging hindrances, nivarana anusya, and latent dispositions fetters and defilements nine categories, right? so here is a clarification by the uh, other himself now in the names of the asavas and so on there are the word kama and bhava huh? uh, if you look at the Pali passage you see the word kama sava bhava sava and then kama yoga bhava yoga and so on so what is represented by kama and what is represented by bhava in these words so here the other give us a clarification it is craving that is intended by the term sensual desire and attachment to existence now Kama originally means something, uh, a desirable object and bhava means existence but here in the word kama sawa, bhava sawa and so on we must understand kama as tanha, craving that has the desirable sense objects as object and also by bhava we must understand not the existence but attachment or craving for existence craving that has existence as its object so by kama is here meant craving and by bhava also is meant craving. So kama asawa, bhava asawa. The asawa that is kama. And so that kama means the craving. Craving that takes the desirable objects as object. And bhava asawa, in the word bhava asawa also, bhava means not existence but attachment to existence or craving for existence. And then Silabata Brahma sa Ida Satya Bi Niwe Sa Atawadu Badana three. Uh, they are just the wrong view. Uh, we must understand 
these as strong views, uh, adherence to uh, rites and ceremonies, and the, uh, and the dogmatic belief that this alone is the truth, and clinging to the doctrine of self. These three we must understand as just wrong view. So wrong view has these three names, adherence to rites and ceremonies, dogmatic belief that uh, this alone is the true truth, and clinging to a doctrine of self. We must understand the uh, unwholesome mental states first, unwholesome mental factors. How many unwholesome mental factors are there? You go back to the second chapter. <laughs> Or you can just look at this chart. Okay. <laughs> okay, let's have a break. 